Okay, there's the build. Uh, hope you liked it. I think it turned out really well. Classy RGB, but this RGB not taking too much from our budget, which of course today, as you know from the title, was £600. So if you're new, first of all, welcome. We love putting together PCs of all shapes and sizes and prices. A few reviews here and there, but our key difference is that we focus on the real life day-to-day -day performance rather than the minutiae you don't care about. So you'll have seen from the title we have the Radeon RX 6500 XT graphics card. We're going to talk about our part choices, the design process and of course the performance, so stay with me. So the RX 6500 XT gets a bad reputation from tech press. You might have seen some of the reviews around this graphics card. But there's not really any sub £200 competition, so if you want a budget system with new parts, there isn't really an alternative at the moment. But this graphics card can actually perform very nicely at 1080p resolution in most of the popular titles out there. I'm thinking things like Fortnite, Valorant, Apex Legends, these kind of things, but even some of the older AAA titles like Shadow of the Tomb Raider. What a lot of people miss is that using this graphics card can be great, but only with a careful selection of parts and in that vein let's talk about the components we've chosen and why. So PCIe generation 4 is the key goal here so if you didn't know the PCIe interface is how the graphics card talks to the rest of your system. There are a few other features but this is the main one. The two types to consider are PCIe generation or gen 3 and PCIe gen 4 with gen 4 being newer and faster. Then there's a the number of lanes. For example, most graphics cards are on 16 lanes, or we call that X16, and this goes all the way down to X1 for things like Wi-Fi cards. The gen and the lanes of the PCIe interface tells us how much data can be transferred, and we call this the bandwidth. But why is this important? Well, even if you put a Gen 4 graphics card on a Gen 3 system, it will still work pretty much the same because there are 16 lanes for data to move across, so plenty of bandwidth. The difference is the 6500 XT only has 4 lanes at Gen 4 speed, so this is fine when you put it into a Gen 4 system because those 4 lanes are super fast and at the latest standard, but if you put this graphics card into a Gen 3 system, you start to get serious slowdowns because now your 4 lanes are only running at Gen 3 speed, which isn't quite as fast that's going to cause you slowdowns. And that's why we have to make absolutely sure our system is running on PCIe Gen 4. And this is determined by our choice of CPU and motherboard. That's why we went for the Intel i5-11400 and the Z590D by Gigabyte, because they both support Gen 4. With 6 cores and 12 threads, the 11400 CPU is actually very nice for modern gaming. Another factor is it's really important that your CPU has integrated graphics, like this 11400, because another drawback of the RX 6500 XT is no hardware video encoder. The video encoder is normally used to help with recording game clips and streaming, as well as accelerating some video playback. Sometimes if you're on YouTube, you use a bit of your graphics card for that. So by having the integrated graphics on the CPU do this job, we've got around that problem so that you can stream away using the Intel Quick Sync feature. All in, I paid about £590 for all of this lot, which is not too bad at all. Um, there's a price breakdown on the screen now, so you can see what each individual component cost. But enough of that, show me the performance! So let's start with some gaming. The budget builds like this are perfectly suited to your most popular esports titles, and one of those titles is Apex Legends, a game that's fairly light to play, but not one of these super light titles like CSGO. So how did we get on? Now we decided to do this at 1440p resolution, really for no reason other than that the test monitor we're using is 1440p, so I thought I'd give it a go. Pleasantly surprised by the results here, so our average FPS, 1440p, medium settings, we're getting around 70 FPS, 70 to 75 FPS, which I would actually consider pretty good for a budget system. Now unfortunately I don't have any of this on tape here, um, but we turned it down to 1080p medium settings. We were getting closer to around the 100 to 110 FPS average mark, which is certainly playable. If you want to put those settings down a bit, down to low, I'm convinced you can get up to 144 FPS, uh, especially given some nice cooling on this system. Now, Fortnite is a game where this kind of system can really excel and it can really show you the kind of 
performance you can get from a well-optimized game, even on modest hardware, and that's exactly what we've got here. You know, considering the fact we're on a budget system, I'm still able to clean up this lobby and get the victory royale. Um, and it was actually a very nice, smooth experience. I played this on the proper gaming monitor and everything, and it was really nice to use. We're currently testing at 1440p resolution, um, and this is actually on low settings. Um, so everything on low, apart from the draw distance, which is on epic. And this is what most of the competitive players play on, because it cuts out all the unnecessary guff, guff on the screen. Um, so that you can focus on fighting your opponents. But you can see from the display in the top left here that our GPU usage is pretty much maxed out the whole time, which tells us that if we were to go down to something like 1080p resolution for this, we'd probably get even better performance. And I, I'm convinced that this machine could easily get over 200 frames per second average on 1080p competitive settings. So apart from these real life online scenarios, what have we got from our benchmark side of things? Because it is nice to have a standardized test that we can compare our machine between running heaven benchmark now our fps average was 75 with a score of 1889 so definitely still in that budget category um, for example if we're talking about super high end stuff things like 3080s are getting in the 5000s in terms of score um, but if i was to compare this against something close to it this kind of score is what i'd expect from something like a gtx 1660 maybe a, maybe one of the better 1650 supers maybe 1660 super that's the kind of range that we're talking about here and our final benchmarky type gaming test is shadow of the tomb raider it is a favorite on youtube for some reason i've never actually played this game um, but we played at 1440p maximum setting, so the highest preset, um, and we got 36 average FPS, which is pretty low. But remember, this is a AAA title. We're playing on a budget machine. I think this is probably fair enough. Let's try it on 1080p max settings and see what we get. Uh, so we got 60 FPS on 1080p max settings, which is great because these kind of story games, you want to turn that visuals up. You want to get that eye candy. Um, and having 60 frames per second is absolutely fine. Um, personally, when I play games, I don't really put them on the max preset. Probably the high would probably be better because the difference between the max and the high is not very much. So you probably get even more performance by doing that. Now, another metric of performance is, of course, temperature testing. See how we did. This is a component of you know, the case, the cooling solution. So let's check it out. So we run our CPU and video card temperature tests at the same time, gives us a real worst case scenario. Talk about worst case scenario, the test that we use for the CPU is called Prime95 and if you don't know it's one of these programs that really puts your computer under intense stress, more stress than you're ever going to see in any real life usage. Basically, it's just to show that this computer is not going to blow up um, if we chuck a huge load on it. We did have some pretty high temperatures here. So this is Prime 95, 30 minutes, maximum CPU temperature being 99 degrees C. Uh, you might be a bit scared seeing this around you know, 100 degrees. It's actually a fairly normal finding uh, in this kind of system. It's because we're using the stock cooler, the free one that comes with the CPU. If you were to put something on here like a Vetro V5 or an Arctic Freezer 34, I'm confident that this is going to be down in the 70s where it's going to be much more manageable. When you don't have those super high spikes, we're getting around 94 degrees, um, but that's still pretty high. But as you saw in the gaming benchmarks, the temperature was available on the screen there. It was nowhere near this. So remember, this is a worst case scenario. Video card temperature test next. So this is 30 minutes of OCCT. We put this on 3D, max it out, leave it for half an hour, see what the highest temperature is. And this was 65 degrees Celsius. I wasn't expecting this to be a high temperature at all because the 6500 XT is very, very easy to cool. I'm convinced if you know that meme with the cat with the tail and it's, it's fanning the ice cube, I think that would probably be enough to cool this chip. So it's no surprise we've got fantastic temperatures here. Remember with graphics cards, we're not worried until those temperatures are going over 80 degrees. So absolutely fantastic. So as you can see, not too shabby for this budget machine. Don't let snobs online bully you. If you enjoy your gaming, that's all that matters. Don't let people browbeat you into buying this or buying that. Just get what suits your needs. But what would I change about this build if I did it again? Firstly, I'd probably chuck in a budget tower air cooler on this. Something like a Vetru V5 would be awesome, and it'd probably drop those CPU temperatures by around 20 degrees. I'd get a slightly posher SSD, something with DRAM, 
I mean, I'd probably go for one terabyte as well to get a bit more stuff on there. I'd also go for a 750 watt power supply like the MWE Bronze V2 by Cooler Master. This gives you a little bit more headroom and upgradability in the system. But all these, of course, add cost to our build and that takes it over the 600 pound target. But is there anything I could do instead that costs basically no extra money to get a bit more performance out of our budget? You could go for a different CPU and motherboard. The i3-12100 CPU and a decent B660 motherboard would cost around the same, and despite this being an i3, uh, would actually be a hair faster than the 11400 and give us a little bit more upgrade potential and, crucially, keeps that PCIe Gen 4 platform in place. So why didn't I just do that in the first place? Well, the reason I can afford to actually do all the builds you see on the channel is not because I'm some huge YouTuber or because I won the lottery. Uh, I run JCPC Customs, which is a system building business, and this choice was basically driven by marketing. So even if the i3 is faster, that i3 badge tends to turn people off. The i5 will probably sell faster even if it's a bit slower because the general public aren't really as well informed. It's not really their fault, it's just very confusing from Intel having this i3, i5 and all this business. I have to market these to sell, hence the i5 over the i3. Conclusion time. All in, happy with the performance. So this CIT Pyro case Actually not bad for the £33 that we paid for it. There's certainly worse cases that are even more expensive than this, but it's not as good as something like the MSI Mag Forge that we just reviewed at £45, but still decent. If you'd like to see that review, uh, it's up on your screen there. Uh, but until next time, subscribe, like, comment, share. I hope to see you back here soon.